My name is Jason Pariso. I'm the Director of Operations for the University of Chicago Innovation Fund. I'm here with uh, my comrades Gorana uh, from the Polsky Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation at the Booth School of Business, and uh, Wolfgang Connell. He's a Program Manager at the Chicago Innovation Exchange, which uh, manages the Innovation Fund. So uh, I'd love to introduce you to the Innovation Fund today, uh, what we're doing, and uh, the type of applications we're looking for. Uh, looking for. Uh, this, I have about 16 slides. It's reasonably brief. And then the rest of the time, I will dedicate to Q&A. So let's see how it goes. So first, I'll just tell you a bit about the, the, the CIE, as well as the Polsky Center, for those that have not been engaged previously. The Chicago Innovation Exchange is a new uh, cross-campus initiative by the University of Chicago that includes our national lab partners that makes available collaboration space for multidisciplinary teams trying to commercialize their technologies, along with um, incubation space, programming, and now funding through the Innovation Fund. So we have 34,000 square feet of space on 53rd Street, just north of the university campus. Uh, that includes you know, meeting space, event space. Uh, soon we will have a rapid prototyping facility that's opening this summer. And there will actually be an Argonne office. Uh, David, I'll let them speak to you on that one. Uh, secondly, the, the Polsky Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. It's a renowned, uh, renowned group at the Booth School of Business. The New Venture Challenge they've been running now since 1997. Uh, has been one of the most successful business uh, accelerator programs and competitions uh, in, the, in the country. They what, had $4 billion of exits over the past few years of companies that had been built during the New Venture Challenge and have uh, since either gone public or been bought by other companies. Uh, what's interesting about the Polsky Center and, and the CIA is we've combined forces to bring some of their entrepreneurship programming across campus and open it up to a wider audience. So we have had, I think, over 110 uh, events to date at the CIE, and uh, to date means since we opened in mid-October of this past year. So in a very brief period of time, we've had a large amount of programming that's been open to postdocs, PhDs, PIs. Uh, the one, uh, there's a few that might be interesting to you that we're happy to talk about later, including the collaboratorium, whereby PIs can pitch their technologies, their, their potential project to a wide audience from across the university in the hopes of forming those multidisciplinary teams. You know, that's uh, with many teams that have gone through the NBC have been formed in just that way. But what everyone's here to hear about today is the Innovation Fund. Let me tell you a bit about the Innovation Fund. So sitting on the board of the Innovation Fund is Alan Thomas, who is the head of UC Tech. It's our technology transfer office at the university. John Flavin, who's the executive director of the CIE. He's a serial biotech entrepreneur. He's actually taken two biotech companies public on the NASDAQ. And Scott Meadow, who is a, uh, a professor at the Booth School of Business, who runs a class called Commercializing Innovation, essentially um, how to make venture capital investments and previously has been a uh, private equity and venture capital investor for north of 30 years. He was, a, for instance, I think the first investor in Staples and Office Depot, uh, moved into healthcare, and then eventually healthcare services. He has a pretty wide background as well. He actually sat on one of uh, John's boards for a biotech firm. The focus of the fund is quite broad. We do, we do look for projects that have the potential for large commercial impact, but uh, we are also focused on projects that will enhance the university's reputation. Those may be scientific bedrock that will likely be you know, commercialized, but to a much lesser extent, that other academics may use the technology that's being created or more may form the basis for a new line of inquiry that it's hard to get other base funding for. And then lastly, uh, to aid humankind. Now, that sounds a pretty broad comment, but what we mean there is, I guess a good example, maybe there's an orphaned condition that it's unlikely that someone else will pay attention to if, it's, if we wouldn't fund it internally. The fund is a the brand new fund. It's a $20 million fund. The intent is to spend that money over the course of the next 10 years and ideally continue to raise additional funds. We have an associates program, which I'll, I'll speak about in depth in a moment. We have 21 venture associates that help us perform due diligence on the projects that come through our pipeline. We run two cycles, one in the fall and one in the spring. We usually take five to seven teams through each of those cycles. Uh, the general dollar amount that you can request is anywhere from between fifty dollars and $250,000 per project. And we usually fund two to five companies in any given round. It's really dependent upon quality, not quantity. I don't have any minimum of dollars I have to put out. I mean, there is clearly a maximum, but we have not hit that max yet. This past fall, we had 54 applications. Uh, notably, we actually had 17 from Argonne, uh, one of whom won, won an award. We moved seven of those companies into diligence, and then we made four investments. So this past fall, we, the company I mentioned that was here from Argonne, uh, he's uh, Michael Wild. I don't know if any of you have met him. It's a pretty big place. 
but uh, he is jointly appointed here at Argonne at the, and at the Computation Institute at the University of Chicago. Uh, they won $120,000 to commercialize their technology. Two ed tech companies, My Path and Becoming Effective Learners, and a life sciences company. It's, uh, it's um, I'm sorry, a, a peptide to treat hypertrichosideremia. Ooh, didn't say that one right. Um, the previous, just to give you an idea of other things we've invested in, the previous round we invested in another ed tech company, two healthcare IT companies, and an additional life sciences company. Uh, we've been traditionally life sciences heavy. That's because that's what the university um, has a very, you know, we have a very strong life sciences department. Both our medical center and our biological sciences division do spin out a lot of potential license opportunities and new technologies. Uh, that being said, what we're trying to do now is open up the gates to the entirety of the university. We will look at things coming out of the humanity departments. We will spend more time out here in Argonne and Fermilab. We even hold office hours here in building 201 uh, every other week. So. Just because uh, you don't see as many Argon names up here as we would like in the future, uh, that the doors are open. Eligibility. So to be eligible to apply for the Innovation Fund, you need to be a current uh, faculty, staff, or student at the university or our affiliates. So anyone at Argon um, would qualify. The project needs to demonstrate the potential to have a large impact out in the world. That impact can be commercial. It, it could be one of the other categories we discussed. but. Uh, part of what we're looking at is magnitude of potential impact. And lastly, you cannot be funded, it, it cannot be a project that should be funded through existing granting mechanisms. I mean, the big, uh, the big issue there is if it's based research and it's not being, it's not focused on moving something out into the world, uh, it's probably too early for us. And frankly, if there are other larger granting organizations that are out there that this is in their sweet spot, it's likely a better idea to go to them first and come back to us when you need money to take it that last mile. So there's a few characteristics um, around successful projects that I've seen funded over the past three cycles that I've been involved. The first, again, is that potential for impact. Uh, you're being weighed against the other potential uses of the money. So in that cohort of five to seven businesses in the final round, um, you know, we'll, there will likely be a larger request for money than we have dollars to give out in the given round. So part of what we're looking at is, you know, is, this, is this a really big opportunity? Whether a big opportunity for a return to the fund or a big opportunity to have some impact out there in the world. Uh, secondly, highlighting that really clear, acute need in the marketplace. Again, whether that's commercial or not, what we want to understand is how, how badly do people want the thing that you're putting out there into the world? And, and that's a, a good measure for us, is how likely are you to succeed? And then lastly, the project itself should be focused on, again, moving you out the door, trying to find that point B out there in the world. So it should be a, a proof of concept, a demonstration, that is likely to attract additional funding, a partner, a license, or actual customers. The projects that have failed, I think, have failed most often on that last bullet. That they've had trouble saying, if I generate such and such data as part of this project, that it's likely someone will want to license my technology. Or if I build this uh, proof of concept, this prototype, it's likely that I'll be able to partner with the company. If, the, if there's no point B at the end of the dollars, um, it, it's difficult to make the case. Our process is actually, it, it's very robust, and it's, uh, it's been structured very similar to a general venture capital process for uh, a couple of important reasons. One, this is also an educational opportunity. I'd mentioned the associates before, and I'll talk about them in a bit. But it is a student-run program. Uh, two, the hope is that we are providing a semi-realistic venture capital experience for the PIs that are engaged in this so that they are more comfortable when it's time to raise larger rounds of money from outside investors down the road. So our process is first a, a proposal, which is now live. So I think if any of you took the handout, that link is live. And you can go begin, uh, you can set up your account and take a look at the questions that are in that, in that proposal. We vet those proposals. As I mentioned last cycle, we had 54 proposals from across the university family down to 20 to 25 that we think have a lot of, a lot of promise. And then we hold a proposal review committee meeting with um, external investors, uh, industry experts, and entrepreneurs from the Chicago area, whereby we choose those five to seven that will move forward. We then move into diligence. You're assigned an associate team of three associates. Our associates, uh, again, are multidisciplinary from across the university. We, have, we had an Argonne associate uh, last cycle. Generally, each team has one PhD or postdoc, one boot school student, and one undergrad that work over the course of eight weeks to perform diligence on your project, to you know, vet the market need, to vet the market size, to try to understand the risks of the business. 
while at the same time, we're working with your team to prepare your management presentation. So it is more of a startup management presentation, trying to paint a picture for success for your project. And then on the final, uh, the final day of the cycle, we have, a large, um, we have a large management presentation directly to our external advisory committee. So you as a team will actually present uh, in front of that entire committee, and then in the afternoon, the diligence team presents, and at the end of that day, that committee makes their investment recommendation to our steering committee. Um, so then obviously we decide who we invest in, we cut those checks as rapidly as possible, and uh, we spend a lot of time after we've invested trying to help you accelerate your project. You know, some we can help more than others. I think the, the example of ones I can't help very much are uh, a few of the pharma investments we've made. I mean, that's just straight lab work. They're going to go do an in vivo study. There's not much we can do to accelerate their progress, but what we can do is start to make external introductions they may not be able to make on their own so that once they generate that data, um, you know, someone's already excited and, and ready to talk to them. Uh, other projects we can, we can have a larger role in trying to help them accelerate their progress. And that's either through programming that we run with the Polsky Center, programming we may run here like the LabCorp, um, or mentors or advisors or EIRs that we can bring to bear from the CIE family. So diligence, I'll, I can briefly talk uh, about diligence. So it is very focused on generating market feedback. A lot of what our student associates teams do is just go out and call people that are in the marketplace that have some knowledge of the application of the technology or go meet with them directly face to face and try to understand what's the actual need out there, how badly are they looking for something like this, what's the metric upon which they would buy it, and that's information that's shared back with the teams. And then, you know, I think additionally, we spend some time assessing the IP and, and the potential financial returns to the university uh, or the fund. And then lastly, validating that pathway to market. So we're trying to understand is, you know, what does this path really look like? How much money is it really going to take to get it out the door to understand where we are in the life cycle of the business and how much risk we're taking on through the investment? The presentation pay I mentioned, I mentioned previously, but uh, just again, there are two sections. There's a management presentation in the morning and a diligence presentation in the afternoon. Uh, you generally get 10 minutes to present and then 10 minutes of Q&A, which is by far the most important part of the entire day. Uh, and then the diligence team in the afternoon has seven minutes to present a few key issues or concerns, followed by eight minutes of Q&A on their funding. Your presentation will be developed uh, entirely by your team, but we do our best to support and advise. So we have uh, templates that can be used. We will provide rounds of feedback. I think generally last cycle for teams that wanted to, I had office hours every week where I would sit down and walk them through their, walk through their presentation and give them feedback. We have one feedback point in the middle of the cycle where we send your decks to the external advisory committee. The hope there is um, to one, generate good feedback, but also get their questions out in the air. So the one thing that I noticed at my very first cycle that killed a lot of teams were just questions unanswered. If there was a big question that was unanswered or answered um, you know, not fully, that tend to kill people quick because in the advisory committee meeting in the afternoon, they just felt, mm, I can't get my head around that particular risk. So what we try to do is get those questions out as early as possible so that you're prepared. And that may not mean that you add a bunch of stuff to your slides you're going to present, but we may put four or five slides in your appendix so that if that question comes up in the room, we can flip to it quickly and you know, address it head on. The diligence presentation we, we spoke about, it is reasonably brief. It's generally uh, five, to, you know, five to seven slides or so that they cover, but their appendix is quite deep with market research. So you know, I think it's not uncommon to see 40 to 50 slide decks on the diligence side of the house, which will be shared with you. Ideally, a lot of that information is useful for you as well. So the investment structure, uh, we invest in two, two main ways. It's either a grant or an actual investment, right? So for those that are not intended to be commercial entities, it is a grant, um, and that would include potential license candidates. So if you were not going to stand up an actual commercial entity, an LLC or otherwise, uh, that would be a grant through Argon that, would, that could then be used to advance your technology in the hopes of attracting a license partner. And then secondly, an actual investment. So uh, we have companies that have been built during the innovation fund process. Uh, we wait for the official LLC document, and at that point we invest with what's called a safe. So I won't bore you with the minutiae on that one. That's something we can talk about in depth um, you know, should you get into the diligence phase. But it's essentially the most entrepreneur-friendly investment vehicle that we could find that allows us to do investments very quickly because it takes very little uh, lawyer time. And, uh, and the terms are the lightest weight investment terms you can get. So the timeline, the application is open as we speak. It actually was opened up after, uh, yesterday afternoon. I think we have something on the order of 17 
accounts have already been set up by people intending to apply. Uh, the proposals are due March 12th. The proposal is not extraordinarily long. It's, uh, it comes to about two pages of text, uh, and then you can attach up to five pages in presentation format to with supporting data to describe your technology, give us a picture of what it is, to provide bios on your team that are more in depth than what are in in the system. There, I mean, there's there's a reason for that. At one forcing people to, to be concise and focus on key questions tends to get us better data. At least that's what we've seen up until now. And two, you know, 54 applications. If we if we allowed everyone to submit 15 pages of stuff, it would be pretty hard to to get through it in a reasonable amount of time. Once you are, uh, you will be notified roughly at the end of March as to whether or not you've been moved into full diligence, and we immediately set up uh, meetings with your diligence team as a kind of a kickoff to walk through the details of the actual process, what's expected. Uh, one of the things that we've seen that's key that we'll do going forward is to have the PI um, designate a single point of contact on their team, whether it's a postdoc, ideally potentially a postdoc, someone who has a bit more time that knows your technology reasonably well, they can respond quickly uh, to questions so that we can turn things around as rapidly as possible. Uh, I'd mentioned that in between point where we send your decks out to the advisory committee, that happens at the end of April. And then the final presentations are due uh, May 8th. Um, and then lastly, the, the presentation day is June 5th. So uh, we are open for questions. And actually, I believe we have a mic. Alex may have it. So if you can, please speak into the mic. They're recording us for those that could not attend. Fire away, sir. So we have developed a technology, and uh, it was developed as the level of a prototype, which was demonstrated here before applying for a patent. And the patent application has been uh, accepted, and the patent was granted last year. But uh, the technology has not been commercialized. There was no production unit that was uh, produced. Uh, it was not tested, but validated. Is it still applicable for this program? Hard to say. I, I would have to look more specifically at the technology and where exactly it was and where the gap was between, you know, you said you'd built a prototype, but you had not done. So I, I don't understand the gap fully between where it needs to be and where it is now to, to opine. Well, the technology is uh, available for licensing, but uh, we do not have any company that uh, has uh, licensed it. So it would be eligible for application, uh, ba based on what I'm hearing. What I would expect to see in that application is, you know, again, a, a clear definition of the market need, who the potential licensee might be, and then why this project would generate data or proof such that it would be likely someone w would want to come license it. So as a follow-up to that question, would it be helpful for us to make some initial contacts with potential licensees as part of the proposal process? Certainly would. I mean, that, that clearly lends weight to your application. If you can mention by name companies that would likely be interested in the fact that you've already spoken with them, but uh, you know that they're that frankly they need X, Y, or Z to be to be motivated to to sign that license. I, think, I believe there's a question in the back. I apologize if, if you covered this before I came in, but <clears throat> if uh, Argonne were to receive funding to do some bench scale, pilot scale work, and then we wanted to go test the technology in the field, and to do that testing, we needed a partner that was either a, a not-for-profit or a commercial entity, would we be allowed to provide them, s them some funding to cover their effort and equipment and what have you? So uh, I, that will depend on the, the exact situation. Um, I think for for-profit external partners, um, there may be some wrangling as to whether or not that's an appropriate use of funds simply because I think what many people would want to see is that they're committed to the project as well. So if we're funding the project internally and they want our internal funding as a for-profit to, to go run that same project, that seems like potentially a misuse of funds. For a, for -pro for a, a non-profit, I can, I can see as a non-profit, it's decidedly hard to raise money. So funding the project on our end may be a, a viable path. I would have to more specific details again. Um, but I think if you have an external for-profit partner uh, that is not willing to commit at least some level of funding to that project, that's a, that's a warning sign that maybe they don't value it all that much. 
at least to us internally. That's how it can be interpreted. Even if it were a very small business also trying to I mean, that, that's a, that, that is the addendum, right? If it's a very small company that doesn't necessarily have the resources, then, then that's a case that could be made. But even then, I think the steering committee would likely want to see some skin in the game. Sure, sure. Okay, thanks. Um, I have a question regarding uh, uh, app application uh, procedure. And the different from uh, conventional argon uh, proposal uh, step, this includes a uh, diligent uh, uh, stage. And the, list, the purpose is, as you uh, tell us, is uh, to evaluate the marketing uh, possibility. And um, for us, we do, we do not uh, know how to uh, include such people uh, in our team. And uh, do you have some suggestion how can we have such uh, expertise in our team and uh, to get these things done? Sure, so I'd say two things. First off, uh, the diligence team is, does not come from Argon. Those are these, uh, the Innovation Fund Associates that I mentioned. So those are individuals that I've already hired and I have you know, 21 of them that are, that are waiting for the kickoff and ready to go. So they've all gone through professional metals class. They've all been trained in venture investing and in diligence. And we also run some additional training on the back end of that to uh, familiarize themselves with our process. And it's, it's been pretty successful so far. As far as your, your presentation, we will work with you uh, to set expectations as to what we're looking for. We will revise it you know, with you every week if you need that, that level of help. Um, we try to customize it. We make ourselves available, frankly, for the entirety of, of, the, of the diligence period to make sure we give you the best chance possible. I mean, it, it helps all of us out, right? I, I want to make every, every PI that applies look as good as I can and make sure that we answer questions that we know are going to be coming. It's, uh, you know, it's just always the wiffle ball that, that catches you off guard. So we try to prepare you as best we can, and then we, we let you loose on the advisory committee. I just wanted to um, uh, bring something to the attention of our gun uh, investigators is that uh, the TDC is willing and uh, ready to help uh, you uh, prepare a quality proposal uh, and uh, initially also help with the intellectual property status and uh, suggest you various, uh, um, in a way, a roadmap uh, uh, for, uh, for making a proposal to the Innovation Fund. And my apologies on that. I should have mentioned that earlier. Um, when I showed the teams, uh, th there was some text, I believe, around a, a project manager being assigned. So that's kind of the internal. I'm not sure if you use the same terminology here at uh, Argonne, but the terminology at UChicago that uh, if you don't have a technology transfer PM that already knows your technology and it's likely to result in a patent, that we put you in touch with their office and add them to the team. And we'll do the same here. So anyone that applies through Argonne uh, that uh, is selected to go into the finals, we will connect immediately with, with TDC to make sure that if a patent will be generated, if a license is at stake, that they're engaged fully as a, to make sure that the IP is, is protected, presented properly, and provides additional assistance as you prepare for the Innovation Fund final. Hi, could, uh, could you or perhaps David speak to some of the key differences between this and the LabCorp program? Because I know that's also something that CIE is affiliated with. Sure, sure. I, I'm a also a big fan of the LabCorp program. I'm working with David directly on it, as, uh, as well as with Wolf. And I actually work with Gorana on the, uh, the NSF version of the i at, at Booth. So they, they are completely different programs. There is uh, funding that goes with both. LabCorp um, is approximately $75,000. I believe that's the working amount now per team. That is a grant from the DOE that is to be used specifically for customer development activities. A very specific subset of activities, likely travel, to conferences, travel to key customers, trying to understand exactly what their needs are. Um, and that is an educational program. So the entire focus of LabCorp is teaching you the customer development process so that you can basically generate a hypothesis of what your business could look like, who your customer is going to be, what your value proposition is going to be. And then we teach you the process to then go out and test out in the world and revise that until you find, ideally, a repeatable business model. So I think an extraordinarily valuable program, but different Ideally, in the future, teams that have gone through that program will be teams that are applying to us, right? So the, the best fit stage would be a company coming out of the LabCorp that now has 
a very clear idea of their business model, a very clear, clear idea of their path to market, and says, to me, I need $200,000 to go do X, Y, or Z that will let me either begin selling, license, and any of those other things. But um, so different, different applications, but again, still the same hope. We're trying to find different ways to help uh, researchers across the university and the labs move their technologies out into the world. Hmm? Yes, please do, please do. So um, I'm David McCallum. I'm along with Jason and Wolf uh, running the uh, LabCorp program. So who here has heard of the LabCorp program and seen the publicity? Okay. So some people were, so was somewhat effective. Okay. So um, what Jason said, the, the idea of the LabCorp program, DOE funded 75K, the idea is to come up to, uh, to give people at the lab time to investigate the technology and determine if it is commercializable. We, we pr the, the idea is that we can provide full training for people who no know nothing about business to allow them to make that determination. Um, so it, in terms of the application, the application process will be very similar to the application process you just described, Jason just described for the, uh, for the, the innovation fund. Um, we are going to roll out uh, an application form this week and we'll be looking for applications by the middle of March. So just send out an email. Uh, we have a mailing list. I don't know if anyone, if everyone here is on it, but if you want to be on the mailing list for the uh, uh, for the LabCorp program, please see me after the meeting, and we'll I, I can get your business card, your contact information. Thanks. I, I would strongly recommend that any of you that are in the room that that are interested in commercializing your technology. And I'm assuming that's why you're here. I would strongly recommend that you apply for the LabCorp. It has been a very successful program. So the LabCorp is the DOE's version of the NSFI Corps, which has been an extraordinarily successful program over the course of the past, uh, I believe, three years now. And a good data point there is SBIR win rates are 10 to 15 percent, uh, depending upon the year. But teams that have gone through the National I Corps program, their win rates are almost 70 percent now. So the most recent data point I saw was 68 percent of the teams that applied for an SBIR after graduating from the I Corps won their phase one award. So I mean that, that's a pathway to nearly a million dollars of dilution free, um, you know, AKA free money. Hi, um, so I've <coughs> filed an invention report on a type of technology and I'm seeking funds to provide proof of concept and pursue a patent. Is that potentially appropriate? for this type of funding? It is. I, again, I think we are very market focused. So as part of that, I think that's a, that could very well be a great fit. As part of that, we would want to see a clear description of you know, why the world needs what you're working on, what the market need is, and that kind of as pointed as you can be, combined with ideally you've spoken to people that you think might use it, and there's reason to believe that they will based upon this prototype. All right, I'm, I'm, I think I have another 30 minutes blocked off to stay and answer questions. Uh, but uh, if not, thank you for your time this morning. Stay warm out there. And uh, feel free to email me or give me a call if you have any questions uh, throughout the application process. Thank you for your time today, everyone. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, one last thing. I believe many of you saw the handouts that were in the back. So please do grab them. We'd love to have you down at the Chicago Innovation Exchange engaging with students from across the university that are hoping to help people commercialize technologies. Uh, and uh, we have a sign-up sheet as well in the back. So if you're interested in learning more, please do sign up. We'll send out emails over the course of the next couple of weeks. Thank you.